All right, people, we're back. Victory and Vices podcast. Me, Rory Spooner, James Vec back with me again. No Reese Henley. Scheduling conflicts meant he couldn't be with us today. But as you can see below us, a very special guest, Mr. Dean Hammond. Now, Dean, we've been buzzing to have you on, mate. Been looking forward to it all week. Initially, I suppose an excellent place to start amongst the chaos that is going on is how are you keeping, mate? How's things? Not bad, mate, to be honest. Um, lockdown's been been interesting. Um, yeah. I would say the homeschooling's been a bit of a challenge. We've got three <laughs> kids, so but we, we've survived that, mate. So uh, that's all good. Yeah, but not too bad, to, to be honest. Um, family's all safe and well, and I think that's all you can ask for. So I'm all right. I'm all good. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. You know, the main thing is everyone's kind of sort of come through unscathed to a degree. Uh, to a degree, the, the the mental scars may still be there a while from the homeschooling, but <laughs> but yeah, I'm unscathed apart from that. Um, in terms of yourself, mate, I was obviously doing my due diligence earlier on before you came, and uh, looking at what you're doing now, I'm, I'm very fascinated to talk about that as well as the footballing career. Now, obviously, being big football fans, um, you know the career you've had it very much intrigues us, but being big podcast fans. That intrigues me as well. So I'm right in thinking you've got your own podcast as well now then, that's correct. Yeah, so I've got a podcast that we started, um, oh God, must be a few months back now. Um, yeah. It's all about life after sport. So it's like what happens to everyone after the game um, yeah, and when yeah. you transition of the game. Um, and just been speaking to, at the moment, it's all surrounded around football, but it's, it's been speaking to like ex-players and how they found that transition. Would they have done anything different in their career that they, they think would have helped them? What advice could they give to, to the younger generation or players that are out the game now that are still struggling? Um, so, yeah, just more concentrating on the, the, the life or your life after the game because I struggled with it personally. Um, didn't think I would, mm. um, but my career finished a lot quicker uh, than I'd planned, um, and that was that wasn't through um, not being able to play. That was just through being drained, mentally drained, um, and the effects that that has on your life and, and your family. Um, so yeah, just just trying to get a, a more positive message out there and trying to open, open help us blokes open up a bit and talk to each other because we don't like doing that. You know, we all put a mask <laughs> on and put a front up. So um, one thing that's you know, you mentioned lockdown there. The one thing that's massively helped me in lockdown is is actually opening up and speaking to people and, and hearing about their experiences and um, relating to theirs and, and sharing mine and seems to help people. So that's what the podcast is all about. Yeah, yeah. I believe the term is each one teach one from what I gather, from what I've learned along my life experiences. So, yeah. Are you a big podcast guy then? Do you listen to anything in particular? Do you know what? I, I'm, I'm, in, I dip in and out of things, really. Um, mm. I'm more of a more of a reader, uh, oh, but I do like a I do like a podcast. I must admit, when I'm when I'm out walking, but look, a variety of things, anything that I'm just recommended, really. Um, the high performance podcast is is pretty interesting, yeah. um, but like this, I don't always go for the let's say, let's say the bigger ones that are branded out there. I like different yeah. ones, interesting ones. You know, listening to people that have achieved in their life, really. Um, that's what really interests me. And the people from all different backgrounds. Uh, I don't think you need to be a certain character or a certain person or anything to, to achieve. And I think everyone's achievements or success is, is all different as well. You know, some people think that's a financial thing. Some people think that's freedom, whatever it is. So I find it fascinating. And, and they're the sort of podcasts I like listening to. Yeah. Do you know what's really interesting is, it's funny enough you should say that, I try and listen now to... Uh, a wide variety of podcasts, whether it's about finances and financial literacy or sport or, or mental health or anything like that. And it's funny, literally, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, me and my mother were discussing it. And I, I told her I got rid of my TV license. And she was like, why did you get rid of your TV license? And I was like, there's so much good content out there from a podcast standpoint. I feel like watching podcasts for a year, I could learn more doing that than, than I could ever watching celebrity big brother <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, there's, a, there's a whole world of content out there that is incredibly useful like you know libraries used to be where all the answers were and now i feel like you know for the generation that's there youtube is sort of is sort of the um the, the new library almost so to speak you know there's nothing you can't find on there you know you you need to fix a Ford Focus go on YouTube you've got a mental health issue go on YouTube you know you need to cook a pizza go on YouTube it's it's, in, it's quite incredible and yeah you're right what you're saying mate there's a, a wide variety of different things out there 
going back to um, obviously your podcast because it's something I um I watched a few clips on and I'm very interested to watch more. Is it going to be just footballers, or are you going to sort of extend that to everybody that's that's been in sport, whether it's cricket, rugby, you know, anything else, anything like that? No, we are going to we are going to try and spread it. Um, obviously, football we've started that because obviously that's the industry I, I've been in. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've spoken to a few other people. We spoke to um, a psychotherapist, um, which yeah. is really really interesting, called Gary Bloom. He's just he's written a book and um, he works with all different sports people on and off the pitch. Um, he's actually the first psychotherapist that works at a professional football club. So he works at Oxford United, which is really interesting because he's actually within the group. He gets access to the players. The manager lets him have full reign, really, uh, with, with the players, which is very, very unique um, because that doesn't really usually work within football clubs. Mm. Um, we've, worked, we've spoken to some journalists. We've spoken to some authors. Um, so... It is evolved around football at the moment within the industry, not necessarily always players. Um, but we would like to get into, um, you know, different sportsmen because I think the mentality of sport is very, very similar. And I think if we can spread that that message as well. And, and Louis, Louis that um, does the podcast with me, he's a professional golfer. So we we'll probably go into golfers next as well. Uh, but yeah, like, like you say, trying to get variety, I think is key um, just to, just to speak to as many people as we possibly can and, and allow them to share their experiences. I think that's where you get the value from. Oh, yeah. The um, the Mark Schwarzer clip I watched earlier on was fascinating. Like, we talked with, um, uh, I think it was Matt Jarvis the other day about how footballers, we don't necessarily appreciate them. Um, and we kind of look at them from a robotic standpoint. And we we always laugh on this podcast. Even. We say, you know, a third choice goalkeeper. It's a bit like being an Instagram influencer. You know, you get paid well, you travel the world, you take a few pics, you know, you've got a gym membership. It's a pretty cushy job, right? But then when, when, when I saw Mark Swarter talk about it, I was thinking to myself, oh, I kind of feel bad for him. Like, do you mean? Because he said, you know, about whilst he winning the title, he's like, I, I never really won the title. You know, I was there and I had the best seat in the house but I never really achieved it. And it got me thinking, do you feel as a footballer, uh, especially looking back now, that we don't maybe necessarily appreciate the scrutiny and the pressure that comes that comes with it? It's a great question. Um, I think it's unfair to probably say that fans should understand it because I think now is very, very different. I think players, mm. clubs and, and associations share a lot more. You're talking about mental health players coming out, so they share more of the experiences. So it's easier for fans to to, to understand what people are potentially going through. Mm. Um, but look, football football's up and down. It's like any, any part of life. It, it's up and down. You face challenges and you only live within your own bubble. So I live my life. You guys live your life. I'm, I, I don't judge you. You don't judge me. I don't know what it's like to feel like be like you. You don't know what it's like to feel like me. And yeah. and that all it is that I was a footballer and you did something else. There's no difference in being a person or a human being. Um, but football is that you're privileged. It's a brilliant experience. I loved every minute of it, even the lows. Um, you know, looking back on things, you know, the, the challenges I suffered when I come out of my career, I wouldn't change them now. It's made me the person I am. It's difficult at the time. And maybe they're the things that are not appreciated because when you come out of the game, when you've done something you've loved for so long, you know, I played football from 11 years old to age 34 and did nothing else. That's all I did, mm. nothing. And then suddenly someone just goes, or I choose to, for whatever reason, you can't do anything like that anymore. You know the thing you love doing, you mm. can't do anything. You can do a different variety of it. You can go and coach, you can go and scout, you can, you can work on the video analysis, you can be in recruitment. But the thing you love doing, you can't do that anymore. And it's almost like you have to go through a grieving period. And I think that's the bit that players need to come out and share more. And if we share more, there'll be more understanding. I think there needs to be a balance. So I would never judge anyone. I'd never question anyone saying fans need to need to understand what players go through. This is a tough experience because I would never think, well, fans need to ex- understand what players are going through. I'm not going to judge them. I don't think they should judge us. Yeah. No, it's a fair shout, mate. It's a fair shout. I mean, it's uh, adult life in general. I feel like it's a lot of soul searching, especially when you think you've got it all mapped out. And like you said, someone then just says, okay, by the way, you can't do this anymore. Or maybe you can't participate in the way you, you kind of would or should. What would be the best piece of advice you could give someone having been through that? In terms of coming out of the game? Yeah, in terms of just uh, in terms of as you said, it's almost like a grievance, pe- a, a grieving period. You, um, I think you talked a, a clip I saw about you know turning to alcohol as well. Yeah. Obviously, in terms of coping with 
not loss as such, but having to 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 refine yourself. And obviously you have to do a bit of soul searching. And what what sort of coping mechanisms have you found work well for you? Well, you've got to prepare yourself 100 percent And that doesn't mean, and I'm not always talking when people always when I say that, people go, Well, I did prepare myself financially. I'm I'm ready and all that. I'm not talking about financially, I'm talking about emotionally. You've got to prepare mm. yourself that you've got to be ready for it. Um you've got to maintain a structure in your life. You need a routine. You know, uh, for instance, as a footballer, I've gone to school from four years old till 16. I've been told what to do, how to do it, where to be, what to wear. I've gone from 16 to 34, been told what to do, how to do it, uh, what to wear, what time I need to be. And then suddenly I come out of the game and I've got all this freedom, all this flexibility, no structure, no routine. And that's where problems start to unfold. It's really, really exciting for two, three weeks. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> like, a, like a kid in a, in a candy shop and you think you can do anything. And then suddenly there's a few problems. So you definitely need routine. Um, you, need to, you need to find that purpose. You need to find out what you want to do next. What, what, what can I do next? Because most players like to try and get to 35 years old. That's the magic number. Mm. And if you get to that and you come out of the game, you've probably got, you know, 50, 50, 60 years left of your life. You're not even halfway through your life and suddenly yeah. you feel those, your life's over. So you definitely need that purpose and um, understanding yourself. That's the, that's the journey I've been through for the last four years is trying to understand myself and, and who I am. Because when you're in professional football or professional sport, you have to become a certain type of person. And that's not always who you really are. And you've got to be comfortable with finding that person again or understanding that you're that person again. So definitely purpose, definitely structure. Your health and your fitness is really, really important. Um, and having, a, and having well, understanding yourself, having that identity is, is important. If you can work on them and be aware that you're going to need to work on them, then you've got, you've got a better chance. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. With um, player welfare, I was actually interested to, um, to talk about that with you. And um, I was curious to see how, how f- will clubs go the extra mile for players? So, for example, obviously Jesse Lingard suffered a lot with his mental health. Um, he was struggling very badly, obviously, with things that were going on at home. And then yesterday, uh, we don't have the ins and outs of it, but I don't know if you saw. Did you see the Ollie McBurney situation? No. No, Not basically, so. uh, Ollie McBurney, the video is quite hilarious, but there's probably a more sinister side to it where he gets into it with a group of fans and um, I think they basically they end up getting into a fight. Ollie McBurney ends up punching this guy. Uh, he ends up stamping on his phone. We've kind of got one half of the story, but there's probably another sort of, like I said, more sinister part to it. In terms of player welfare, with situations like obviously Jesse Lingard or Ollie McBurney or anybody else in between, do clubs still go the extra mile to protect those players? Is there sort of like a, a structure in place for situations like that? Oh, um... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, to be honest. From my experience, the player, <laughs> how do I put this? Um, clubs will look after their assets, put it yeah. that way, as a business. If you're still an asset and you're valuable to the football club, I think you'll be you'll be well looked after, you'll be protected and yeah. um, you'll be helped. Now, that's a bit harsh. I think clubs will try and help you, but they. you've asked me the question, will they go the extra mile? Mm. Yes, you're still valuable to the to the football club because football's a business now it's as simple yeah. as that yeah. if you look at it any other way I think you're very very naive especially at the top level we're talking about Premier League footballers it's there's huge money huge money in it you've got to look after your assets but as soon as you don't become important as soon as you're not needed I think there's an effort that clubs go to but do they put their neck on the line for you probably not would they massively help you if they wasn't aware of the problem? There's no structure in place. Let me put it mm. like that. No structure yeah. for it. Right, this player's going to be leave the football club. This is a structure. This is a routine you need to go through now. We can help you with this, 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 and this. This is what we need to do for you. So there's more that can be done, definitely. But also, I always like to look to it. There needs to be a balance. Players need to take more responsibility as well. So there needs to be a bit from both, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Got it. Do you think as well, uh, Dean, that with the ever-growing presence of social media as well, you mentioned how far or what lengths clubs will go to to maybe protect a player, but you, like you mentioned, Spooner, with Ollie McBurney, that footage was there mm-hmm. for everybody to see um, and it was shared and retweeted and, and, and posted so fast. 
do you think it kind of forces or puts clubs in a difficult position maybe compared to 10, 20 years ago in terms of protecting players because of the backlash that you can get off of social media as a result then? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. social, social media is a, a brilliant thing. It, it, it is, but it's also a dangerous thing as well. And it's, <laughs> it's difficult. It's, the one thing you can't do with social media is control it. Um, so that's what I mean where players and players and clubs need to, there's a balance. Players need to take more responsibility and, like, I'm not judging anyone. We've all been in situations that are not comfortable. Um, I probably I've been in a few myself, but I was a bit younger and there was <laughs> phones around. So yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Um, so not recorded. Um, so players need to be a little bit more aware, and that comes through education. And could clubs do more? You know, could clubs advise players a little bit more? Could could you know what when, when we put it this way? When we used to go out as a, as a as a club as a team, we would have security with us. So if we went out as a group, as a team, security would be with us. Because if there's any trouble, they would just stamp it out straight away. Yeah. If the player's been an idiot, they'd grab him and have a word with him. If there's some fans or anyone's getting a bit silly, it would be stamped out straight away without even you knowing it. So the clubs can do that. That's really, really good. But obviously players are not always going to be involved in a club. They get, what, six to eight weeks off in the summer. Yeah, uh, They want to enjoy themselves. They want to have a normal life. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We all want to enjoy that. Um, but yeah, you need to just be a little bit aware and just walk away from situations. I think if that situation ever comes up, it, it's difficult, uh, especially under the influence of alcohol. We've all, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as they're on social media, there's nothing you can do. It's out there to the world. And Yeah. Uh, but that's the up and down of social media. So how you control that, I don't know. I think, like anything, it's through education. Can you ha- talk to the players more, put some, I don't know, structure in place that if this happens, you need to do this? It's, it's difficult, really difficult. Yeah, it seems like anybody can get it because the one incident I think back to, and I smile about it now, but at the time I was like, oh, I don't know about this, was the Harry Maguire incident in Greece last summer where Harry seems like such a lovely guy as well. Wherever you know you see him in an interview, he's really well-spoken, but something triggered him with those Greek police. <laughs> and he had a few beers, and next thing you know, he's getting his legs smashed up. They're claiming he assaulted them. It's, it's just chaos. Like, it's absolutely... And all of a sudden, he's under this massive scrutiny. And I remember thinking, just from a mental health standpoint, again, from a player welfare standpoint, Harry Maguire, he must be feeling like a tortured soul because he may not have done anything wrong, but the initial perception is he's the bad guy. And I just think to myself, could I ever cope with that level of scrutiny? I think it's that, it's the perception. You don't, even if you're, you've done nothing wrong, you're protecting yourself, you don't get the chance to, to give your side of the story, really. And even if you do, it's probably not believed. Let's be honest. If we yeah. all read the paper or we look on the social media, go, look, there's another footballer, there's another idiot. But you've got to understand with footballers, this is one thing that, so what, during my career, I was really, really dedicated, you know, really dedicated to my profession. I had to be, to, to, to get to the level I got to and the player I was, I had to give everything. Mm. But if I had a drink, it's like it's like letting a cage out of an animal, uh, an animal out of a cage. It's like it's like a bit of freedom. Mm. It's like all right, I'm out of the cage for 24 hours, and you you know I'm just going to enjoy myself. I'm going to let myself loose. I'm going to have I'm going to have great fun before I get put back in the cage for six months. Yeah. So you almost get that, and with players, they just want to enjoy themselves. And obviously, there comes a lot of. Uh, interest when you're out and people want to mm. speak to you and if you don't react in the right way because you, or you've you had a few drinks or um, you're with your family or you're just not in the mood it can turn into something else and, and that's really difficult and you don't get the full story so sometimes it's, it's, it is difficult it, it is difficult really difficult mm. and like I say players sometimes it's not their fault but it is their player it is a player's fault sometimes so there's definitely <laughs> but yeah. it's just that scrutiny and you just that look I think that's why players get paid so much money this is what you have to have it's part of the process of being a footballer you're going to get paid all this money but these are the these are the these are the negative parts of it are you willing to do it yes okay we'll deal with it yeah one of the best ways to learn I suppose is to learn from other people's mistakes so if you may have a teammate that is you know uh, an excellent colleague an excellent friend and you see them fall and you think well you know what I can't make that same mistake. And, you know, it's, it's a valuable learning curve. I mean, was there a particular incident as a player where you saw a fellow teammates sort of get into trouble and you remember thinking, oh, you know, I, I better learn from that? Was there one that maybe stood out for you sort of growing up? 
No, not really, to be honest. Um, nothing that it wasn't really in my personality anyway to, to, to be yeah. like that. I was always the fun guy. I was always the idiot when I was out, <laughs> but I was always the fun guy. I'd never get in trouble or anything yeah, yeah. like that. Um, so I never really saw anything that, that changed my thinking along that way. You'd hear things and there yeah. was certain things that, that happened. Um, there's obviously, um, I wasn't there at the time, so it's hard for me to judge, but yeah. uh, the Southampton, Lee Barnard, obviously got in a, um, a little bit of trouble. Mm. Uh, but that wasn't his fault. He got attacked and he was uh, protecting himself. Yeah. Um, and obviously then the papers write a, a certain story, don't they? So, yeah. um, no, nothing that really happened or I saw that changed my thinking. I think that was just my personality. I didn't drink much if I went out, but I was if I was going out, I was going to have fun, put it that way. <laughs> and then join myself and then put myself back in the cage and train yeah. after another three or four yeah. months. It's, I've, I've, I'm fascinated by stuff like that because we, me and Becky, live quote-unquote regular lives. So I can't imagine what it's like to have that perception that you're immediately cocky, you're immediately arrogant. The lie is always more entertaining than the truth. The perception of you, the scrutiny. I find it fascinating. I, it's just such an incredible insight to actually sit down and, and speak with you and just gain some sort of information on it. But um, yeah, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the scrutiny level, I, I wanted to talk, obviously, because you were a, a loans manager as well. Sorry, mate, for my gather. Yeah. Now, that title in itself, we spoke with a few players about going out on loan. And obviously, young players now in the scrutiny that they're under. How does that work? Because uh, it's the first time I've actually heard of the job title itself. What is a loans manager? Uh, it's a brilliant role. Uh, to, to start with, absolutely loved it and um, probably um, helped me. Um, during that transition to be honest when I went back to Leicester so the loans manager role is it is what it is you look after players that go out on loan so mm. uh, for instance I had Harvey Barnes when Harvey Barnes went on loan oh, to, okay. to Albion. so I would go and watch Harvey play occasionally I might watch him train I would speak to the opponent I would speak to his manager at uh, West Brom mm. um, I would I would get his clips so I'd go through the game with him I'd clip up some games some positives some negatives some things he could work on um, I would report back to the people at Leicester in terms of, right, he's doing this, he, he's, he, he's performing well, whether that was a 23 manager, whether that was director of football, whether that was actually the manager. Um, and then you would just have a relationship with the player where you just try and guide them through that. And that would be mm. mainly, it, it would be football really, but it would be, how are you feeling? You okay? Do you need to talk? You know, going into a, a different dressing room as a young player can be tough. Yeah. And it's just them, you want to, you want them to go online to get the best experience they can to, to get full value out of the experience. And you don't want a player that's an exceptionally good player kind of fade into a dressing room because they don't feel comfortable. They haven't got the confidence. So just be in there then and be able to speak to the, them about what it's going to be like or some, some um, experience that, that I've been through. Um, it's generally like that. And then it's, there's another side to the role where you would be looking for football clubs. You would be speaking to um, other football clubs about getting other players out on loan. Mm. Is it the right club for the player? So you would research the dressing room. You would research uh, the manager. Is it the right playing style? Um, why are we sending that player on loan to that football club? Because if you've got a, a very technical player that's very, very good and wants to get on the ball in the centre midfield, but then he's going to a team who are just getting into their fullbacks and smashing in the channel. <laughs> What's the point of sending him on loan there? Because he's yeah. not going to benefit from it. He's not going to learn anything. So it's doing your research and, and finding the right clubs. Then there's a the financial side to it as well. It, it, there's so many hurdles that you have to jump through, you know, because, you know, if you're getting a player from the Premier League that's, that's on good money and then wants to go to a League One club, a championship club, they're not going to be able to afford his wages. But then the mm. Premier League club's going to go, well, why am I going to lend you my player for free? Mm. You need to give me some money to what he's on. And you've got to, then you've got to find a balance. There's bonuses, there's appearances, there's little clauses that you'd say, well, if, okay, we'll send him on loan to your football club for, say he's on £5,000 a week. You can have him on loan for £2,500 a week or £3,000 a week when he plays. Now, if he doesn't play, you've got to pay £5,000. Yeah. Now, that can work and not work because a player needs to experience the fact that he's got to play well to stay in the team. So 
So from a financial point, it works. But from a player's point of view, I don't think that always works because the players think, well, I'm going I'm to play because this club can't really afford to pay me five grand a week. Yeah. So there's loads of different things. And you're just trying to be there for the player to kind of mentor. You're like a mentor to try and mentor yeah. them through. Um, but brilliant role. Loved it for, for a year. And I only, only left the role because um, my wife's health, my wife had a back operation and I had to give up the role and look after the kids. So, but absolutely uh-huh. love it. Sounds like um, Harvey Barnes has benefited from uh, from your um, tutorship, buddy. He's, um, I don't, I he's, uh, he's an exceptional player, so I don't think there's anything to do with him. <laughs> <laughs> Is he? Uh, do you think he'll go to the uh, to the Euros this summer, Harvey? Do you, do you reckon it's it's on for him? I think he would have done, except for the injury. Yeah, um, he's, he's. I think he's out for the rest of the season. Um, mm. But I think he would have done. He's he's the best I've seen at that age um, in terms of the way he plays. He's like, so when I came through at Southampton, he was, he's very much like um, um, Alex oxlade Chamberlain. He runs with the ball. He's direct with the ball. He'll take chances with the ball. He'll take a shot. He'll take people on. He's exciting. He's the player you want to watch. And he's got, he's, it sounds silly, he's probably faster running with the ball than without it. Yeah. He glides with the ball. And, and um, oxlade Chamberlain was like that as well. So, uh, look, he's going to be a huge talent. I think he'll be the next one that goes for big money from Leicester. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Obviously, going back to the club career, you would have played with, well, a lot of the sort of top English talents. I'm right in thinking, obviously, Ox was there, Harvey Barnes, you, you've obviously helped tutor. You were in the same team as Luke Shaw for a bit as well, is that right? Yeah, Luke Shaw and um, James Ward Prowse were coming through yeah. just just as I left, and James Ward Prowse actually took my place. So, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a he's a good player, a brilliant player. Um, so, yeah, them two were coming through. Obviously, Adam Lallana as well. Yeah, um, Oxford Chamberlain. Trying to think who else was there, but they were the main boys at, at Southampton. Exceptional. Harrison Reed. That's yeah. a, um Matty Target. That's a Villa now. Yeah, uh, targets um, clear. Chambers is a that's Arsenal. Mm. Top talent coming through. No wonder they got rid of me. But it was, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah, they were a pleasure, pleasure to play with. But one, look, the Southampton Academy is superb because they breed really good players. Yeah, but they they breed good people as well. They they bring them up in the right way, which is really important. Yeah, I was going to ask you that actually because it's like a, almost like a secret sauce that they have that no one else seems to be able to produce. Obviously, being at Leicester and seeing their academy, and being at Southampton and seeing their academy, what are sort of the differences? Why is Southampton so good? Is it purely that they sort of put the emphasis on not just football, but you know, making you a well-rounded person? Yes, I think that definitely helps. Um, I think the caption, the uh, the area of Hampshire is a, is a good footballing area. Mm. Um, they're the biggest club there, obviously. Well, I'm not sure Portsmouth fans would say that, but it's <laughs> the biggest club there. Um, and the coaches, the coaches are, are, are fantastic. They really are. Um, and they bring them up to play well, the, the Southampton way, they, they used mm. to say, which is, but there's a pathway. That's the important thing. So you you attract more players. It, it convinces a, a parent to allow their boy to go to Southampton because you've got a pathway of getting into the first team. Is there that pathway for... Man City, Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal. I don't think there is. So going to a club like Southampton, you're going to get your opportunity. And and that's what they do within the football club. There, there, there's, a, there's a pathway, there's a philosophy. So the, the first team manager has to be willing to put younger players in, otherwise the academy doesn't work. There's no point having all these good players and they never get a chance. So mm. it filters down. There's a good fun, we'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Southampton are a very interesting club. We use the term a stepping stone club. Like, for example, I look, look at Leicester as well. Leicester will come on to in a moment. A fantastic place to go and sort of learn your trade and play with a little bit of pressure. So you haven't got the same pressure as other clubs and the same expectations. But at the same time, there's enough there to sort of push you. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you're going to get to play Premier League football. Um, and yeah. Southampton play a good brand of football as well. Um, and it looks like you go through from Southampton, you end up going to Liverpool. I mean, Liverpool must have bought five <laughs> But, yeah, that's the next logical step. Yeah, yeah. Liverpool will play for Southampton's new training ground, so they're not yeah. complaining. But it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is stepping stone. Yeah, probably like that. You, you you're going to learn your trade at the mm. top level, um, and with the expectation to win, but not the expectation to win trophies. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's important. Um, again, you'll work with a really good coach. I think the manager there. Uh, Ralph yeah, at the moment is, is fantastic. I mean, the role, the results are not saying that, 
um, but I like him as a manager. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it, is, it gives you that opportunity as a player where the club will go. They won't stand in your way, which is really, really important. Is that, look, if you perform for the football club um, and you do well for us, you'll get the ability to move on if the price is right. And I think that's important. It gives you confidence as a player and it gives you, uh, it gives you an incentive um, to think, well, if I want to get as high as I can in my football career, I can at Southampton because they're allowing me to leave. Um, and I think Norwich are doing that very well at the minute. Norwich yeah. kind of promised their players, look, come and play for us in the first team. You won't be on much money. But I'll tell you what we do. If you perform well for this football club, we won't ask for a stupid money for you and we'll allow you to move on. Mm, and I think yeah. it works as a player. Yeah, Godfrey's a good example of that. He was at Norwich, right? Yeah, and uh, Max Ahrens is another one as well. I believe that uh, we'll probably move on. So, yeah, it's interesting the pathways that players take. I mean, obviously, looking at James Ward-Prowse, we, we touched upon him. Everyone else seems to have used Southampton as the stepping stone and gone on to a quote-unquote bigger club. Obviously, Ox and Luke Shaw and, and Gareth Bale, amongst other people, and Walcott. Why do you think James Ward-Prowse has never got that move? Uh, Southampton fans are probably not going to like me for saying this, but um, I think he will very, very soon. Um, just, just for the fact that I would say the last two seasons, he's probably been playing in his position. So because his set ball delivery is so good and he was always, that's a big statement, but he was always related to that David Beckham type of player. Yeah. Get him on the right wing, cross a ball in, let the, let the, the, let the striker score, set piece, free, picks, uh, free kicks expert and wasn't related for anything else. Mm. Um, but he's been playing centre midfield and he's been exceptional. And the one thing that's helped him, he's been made captain of the football club. So that that extra responsibility has improved yeah. him the player. It's, it's really brought him on and I can... I can relate to that. You know, wearing the armband, having that extra responsibility, having to lead by example made me a better player. Um, mm. and I think he's come on leaps and bounds in the last 18 months and he's been so consistent. I think he's got eight, nine goals fr from midfield, a few assists. Um, it's almost like he's let the shackles off himself and gone mm. and expressed himself a little bit more. Um, so I think he will be the next one to go. When that will be, I'm, I'm not sure, but... Um, he's, he's taken longer than the other boys to find his find his feet put it that way mm. if, yeah. um, if, if he does go um, where do you think he, he could end up or where or, or two part question really where do you think he will end up and where do you think would be maybe best for him to end up where would he suit yeah it's a good question as well because I think he's the type of player that wouldn't leave unless he was one of the big boys so mm. say I don't know say a Leicester come in, say a West Ham came in, I don't think he would leave. I don't think he, he would only leave for someone like a, a Liverpool, a Manchester United. But is he going to get them clubs? I'm not sure. I mean, it would be ideal for Arsenal. You know, I think he'd fit in that centre midfield role in Arsenal brilliantly. I think they need a player like him. Mm -hmm. I think he would suit Liverpool. I think he would do well in Liverpool. You know, if uh, um, Wanyama or, I uh, know, uh, what's the player's name? The place oh, Wijnaldum. Yeah, one of them. If he leaves, he goes to Barcelona. Mm. I think James Rob Prowse would would fit in there nicely. So, whether they will see that or not, I don't know. Um, mm. But I think he would only leave for one of the big big boys. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he has the technical ability to to certainly play. I look at Man City, for example. If you know they needed a another midfielder that could come in, Ward Prowse. I think he'd be a terrific player. You know, is Ward Prowse technically better than Fred? I think we're all technically better than Fred, right? And I've <laughs> and I and I've never kicked the ball. In, you in said that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm attaching your name to a Dean. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't deny it, right? So look, yeah, I think Ward Prowse. You're right. What you're saying, he he will be the next to go at some point. It's typical, isn't it? Because it's almost like a Letizia situation. Letizia stayed at. At, um, at Southampton forever and a day. And you always think to yourself, oh, what would he have done at a bigger club? Because funny enough, I was watching Leticia highlight, highlight the other day. Oh. And I think it was, um, there was kids like just, re you know, they do reaction videos on YouTube. There was these kids reacting to Matt Leticia. And they were like, who is this guy? Like, what was like the messy of his time? Like, you no, know, YouTube makes everyone look terrific. And uh, I, I get that impression with James Old Prowse now that, he, he does need to make the step up. Is he, is he, do you think, because I don't, obviously we don't know him personally, but can you get too far into a comfort zone? Is he too comfortable there, obviously with family and things? Or do you think he'd maybe sort of go, you know what, okay, now is the time? Again, good question. I mean, he signed a, he signed a five-year deal last season, mm. I think. 
So he was reasonably happy. I think he's enjoying being captain. He's been in the club a long, long time now. Um, and look, and some players like Matt Letizia, like, I mean, it's really interesting to see what Harry Kane does, but some mm. players enjoy staying at the same club. You know, look back on their career and be a club legend, break all the records. Mm. Um, he might just have loved playing for, for Southampton. You know, I've not spoken to James for a long, long time since we were at the club together. So I can't really tell you what he's thinking. But yeah, you, and you could look at it, look at it from this point of view. But we talk about mental health and football. Mm. He's on a lot of money. He's really, really happy. Mm. He's representing his country. If you look mm. at it from that point of view, yeah. except for winning trophies, why would you leave? You know, he's got to maybe say he goes to a Liverpool, he's got to move his whole family all yeah. the way up to Liverpool. He's going to be competing against better players, which some people that, that you know, they love that. That's going to make him a better player. Other players go, no, I don't want that. I want to play every week. I don't want to sit on the bench or be in and out. So mm. I think you have to weigh it up and you can see why some players don't leave. But most players are pretty ambitious. And I think if you want to, I could imagine James Ward Prowse being that and thinking, well, actually, I do quite fancy playing Champions League football. I do quite fancy winning a trophy. I do quite fancy playing more regular for, for England because, look, there's no hiding away from it. If you play for a big club, you've got a better chance of playing for England. It's just the way it works. Mm. Um, so I can see the ups and downs from it uh, and why he would leave and why he wouldn't leave. But I think if he got the opportunity, I think he would go. Yeah, yeah. Be very interested to see what he could do at the top level. Speaking of, obviously, ambition and bigger moves, was there a particular move, be it at home or abroad, that, that you maybe turned down and you look back now and think, oh, you know what, maybe I should have been a bit more ambitious and gone there? No, not, not really. Um, I took a big risk when I signed for Southampton. Mm. Um, I, I was in I was the same level, but I, I was at Colchester and on good money, got offered a new contract and dropped down to Southampton on minus 10 in League One at the time. Mm. Uh, but never hesitated because I got to play to a big football club and within three years we were in the Premier League. So the, 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 I made the right decision. Um, moving to Leicester was brilliant. I mean, I had an opportunity to go to America a couple of times, but I didn't, yeah. didn't, didn't quite take it or didn't quite work out, which my wife was gutted at because she <laughs> had always gone out of America and, and lived yeah. there for a year. So I think the biggest regret was where uh, it was... I left Leicester when we were in the Premier League mm. uh, and the year we won the Premier League. I started, yeah. you know, first couple of games on the bench. I was involved in the squad. And then I dropped down two levels to go on loan to, to Sheffield United where um, I should have been a bit more confident in my ability. Uh, yeah. It was hard to get there. I should have just paused for a minute and, and taken, taken time and taken stock over my decision where I was just that. I still felt like a young kid and wanted to play football every week. Um, mm. But I was 33 years old and, and that wasn't the way it was going to be. So I wouldn't say I ever regretted turning the move down, but I think I probably regretted making a move when, look, Sheffield United still might have been the right move. Just I wish I'd taken a little bit longer over my decision. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, that year, obviously Leicester won the league. Um, we, we all know that how crazy it was and it, it, you know it'll go down in history. You obviously didn't get, you know, the the game time and and the perhaps the situation that you would have liked that season. Did was there a sense of something when when Ranieri came in? A sense of something special was brewing. Did you have any sort of idea that you know? You're not, not asking. Did you have an idea you were going to win the league that year? But was there an idea that something great was going to happen that season, or was it just one huge surprise for everyone? Well, I think look, look at the, the previous season when we stayed up and we won eight out of the last 10 games um, to stay up and they called it the club, the, the great escape because we shouldn't have stayed up. How we found that form, I don't know. Um, but under Nigel Pearson, he done an amazing job uh, and we stayed up. So we, we look, I'm, I, could, I could easily sit here and go, oh yeah, of course we knew we were going to win the league. Of course, that's not true. No chance. We just stayed up in the Premier League. Do we think we're going to do that and then go yeah. and win the Premier League? But in answer to your question, yes, we felt as though we were definitely building something special as a team. Um, we felt as though we could do something better. What, what was the ambition? Probably top 10, maybe, maybe push into Europe, have a good cup run because we'd won eight games out of 10 in the Premier League and we'd blown teams away as well. And, and mm. we'd found our groove. You know, Jamie Vardy was on fire. He just got into the England team. Riyad Mahrez was finding his feet, you know, um, 
Esteban Cambiasso was 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 obviously playing well. Um, Robert Hoofer coming and done an amazing job. Wes Morgan is a brilliant defender, doesn't get mentioned much, but had had that year in the Premier League and felt comfortable and and, and had belief in himself. And look, confidence in football is everything. You'll hear managers and players say it when someone's performing well or not performing well. And we had confidence and belief that, OK, we are Premier League players. Um, and then, yeah, Nigel leaving was a shock. You know, mm. you got to remember, we, start, we started that season without a manager, as in pre-season. So the assistant manager was looking after us for pre-season for the first two weeks. Craig Shakespeare done a brilliant job and the players loved him. So they respected him and didn't take the piss. So we didn't have two weeks off, put it that mm. way. We, we worked hard. And then Ranieri came in and, he done an amazing thing where against his instinct, he wanted to change everything because he wanted to come in. He wanted to make training longer. He wanted to change the formation. He wanted to bring all his own players in. But the players just kind of asked indirectly through the other coaches that give us a chance. Let us prove to you that this is the right way, how we work, how we win. We've just won eight out of the last 10 games in the Premier League. Yeah. Give us a chance to prove ourselves. If it doesn't work, do what you want. You know, you're the manager, but give us the opportunity. And, and Claudio did that. And I think that's the biggest, the best thing he did. Um, and it just obviously took off from there and started the season well. And it does help when you sign a player like Kante. I must admit, it was I, like, I was gonna say. he's like playing with 14 players because he's just unbelievable. And again, another reason why I couldn't get in the team. I mean, <laughs> all these players that kept coming in, someone didn't like me, I think, at every club. But, uh, yeah, look, we, we had a brilliant squad. And um, like I say, the confidence, the players just believe in themselves. And you win a few games, you just don't look back. What was that um that first training session like when you saw Kante? Because obviously he was very unknown, so to speak. So you've like, the lads go, oh, we've signed this guy, Angolo Kante. And you're thinking, well, he's not taking my place. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, how he comes into training. Did he like smash it on the first day? Um. We the first day he trained um, was after, so we had a game um, on the weekend, I think, um, a last preseason game or something. So not the full squad was training. So there was only probably, I don't know, 10 of us training. So we'd done short and sharp stuff. So it was all like small-sided games, possession games. And Christ, was he sharp? Jesus. And obviously, he's only a, a, a small bloke. Yeah. Um, the most polite person you'll meet in your life smiles, lovely man. Um, and you just think, oh, this won't be a problem. It's come from French second division here. Yeah. <laughs> this ain't going to be a problem. It'll be all right. First training session. Oh, my God. Just nicking the ball off people so quick and then running yeah. with the ball. I was like, who's this kid? Like, yeah. seriously, you like go to shoot, you block a shot. And brilliant. He'd, he'd tackle you, knock you over, he'd pick you back up, say sorry. You're like, oh my God, I can't even get angry with you. You're so nice. It's like, <laughs> he was he, he was just brilliant and very, very good on the ball. Um, and yeah, you knew straight away and I thought, oh my God, I might be in a little bit of trouble here. Um, and the first game we played, he actually played left wing. We played a, I think we played a Carlin Cup game or whatever it's called, a uh, League Cup or whatever it's called. Yeah. And he played left, we played away at Berry and he played left wing and absolutely ripped it up. And he's like playing left wing because he's just quick and sharp. Um, yeah. But then he, he made his real impacts when he came on against Aston Villa, I think the fourth game in. Um, the team were 2 0 down. We ended up winning 3 2. And I think he played every minute from there. Yeah, he's he's something else. I watched him in the Real Madrid game the other night when he nicked the ball. And um, <clears throat> I think he'd give it to Pulisic for the Mount goal. And I just remember thinking he had no right to win that ball. Like he had apps, he just came out of nowhere. Like even if you were, if you blinked, you'd have missed him. Like he is that quick and he's phenomenal. Would you say he is the biggest success story from that Leicester team? I know it's difficult because obviously Vardy is an icon in his own right. And obviously Mares now in the Champions League final as well. But did you ever anticipate seeing those two, Mares and Kante against each other in the Champions League final? Uh, probably not. She don't look that far ahead. Yeah. Uh, but Mares was something special. Oh my God. You know, talking about making an impact. He would he came in, he was couldn't speak a word of English. He is thin, he is he is stick thin. He's yeah. honestly, there's nothing to him. But Christ is he strong on the ball. Mm. Um and again, you know, he made a huge impact, but he's a brilliant player. Um, Jamie Vardy, the most effective player ever, because he's just so good at what he does. Quick, aggressive, brilliant finisher. Yeah. Great guy, 
crazy, but he's a great guy. Uh, <laughs> and Kante, obviously, look at you look at Kante's record. He came to Leicester, he won the Premier League. He went to Chelsea, won the Premier League. The next season, he won the World Cup. Yeah, and now he won. Then he won the. Did he then he won the Europa Cup with Chelsea, and now yeah. he might win the Champions League this year? I mean, it's an incredible story. So. I couldn't pick between them three because, I mean, they've had huge impacts. Um, just brilliant. And again, it's a, it's a simple trait. It's a really, if you look at the best people and the best players, they're all good people. Them mm. three blokes, brilliant. Would do anything for you. Nice, mm. polite, give you the time of day, happy, grateful. There's no, there's gotta, there's gotta be something to that. There's gotta be something to that. And, yeah. and just brilliant people again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable level of recruitment, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. to get to get one of those would be, you'd say, well, what brilliant recruitment. Two, uh, but, but to get those three, you know, within such a short space of time is is almost unheard of. That 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 hardly happens, does it? Really, and especially to dig them from from out of left field as well. You know, you mentioned the French second division. You, know, you don't. People don't tend to pluck an awful lot of world class talent from that uh, league, do they? <laughs> no, they said not someone's going to win the World Cup. No, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, but the Leicester have been doing it for years, really. If you look mm-hmm. at their recruitment, um, so you'd say Mares. You'd think Anthony Knockard before that. Yeah. Uh, Mares, um, Jamie Vardy, Kante, um, Harry Maguire. You look at they bought him for what 19 million and sold him for 85 million. It's it's, yeah. it's crazy. Ben Chilwell's come through the, the academy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Suant Chai who's playing center. Oh, center-off. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy paid nothing for him for Fana, but again, quality. You know, 20 million they paid for him in this day and age is like is nothing, it's pocket change. And yeah. it, these are Casper Smichael, you know, they signed him years ago. What a servant, where's Morgan? Robert Hoof came in when we were struggling to stay in the Premier League, came in, made a huge difference. Next year, we won the Premier League. These signings are people that they don't see, but the recruitment, they obviously see something, whether they do it on yeah. statistics, whether they do it on just um, someone's got a really good eye for a player, whether they do it on personality, I don't know. Danny Simpson, you know, Danny Simpson came into the football club and left QPR. No one wanted him. A year later, he's winning the Premier League. So, the recruitment of the football club is good and what they get, and it's one thing, they recruit well as a group. So they don't go for individuals. They, they work out will they fit in the group. Mm. How will they fit in the group? Look, another player, Ndidi. I mean, Ndidi is unbelievable. Oh. What they paid. <laughs> Tillemans. Tillemans they paid nothing yeah. for. Got them alone. So they, but they fit them into a group and that's why Leicester do so well. And that comes from the very top. I mean, the owners are unbelievable as people. Mm. Amazing. Get involved in a football club, uh, speak to the players, uh, reward you if you do really, really well. Very spiritual. Get the players involved in that. Mm. Um, you know, every every season at the beginning of the season, the, the, uh, the, the monks come over and they do a ceremony and they bless the players. They bless the stadium yeah. and everything. They bless the training ground. And there's something in that. Look how well Leicester are doing. Are doing. So, you can you can believe what you believe, but there's there's just an unbelievable culture at Leicester. I know I've gone off track there, but that comes through the, the oh, recruitment system as well. It, they, yeah. Whoever's whoever's doing that is um, you know is is uh, probably getting paid a lot a lot of money. Yeah, they just they always seem to they they'll sell one player when they are a brilliant player, and then just find a replacement for cheaper. It almost seems you. Yeah. They sold Chilwell to Castagna that they brought in. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said Kante, then Ndidi. It's just the yeah. There's it, something special going on there, isn't it? And then obviously you've got Brendan Rodgers as well, who's an, an unbelievable manager. Also, well, what they do, they, they plan ahead. So if you think about it, they're probably looking at a player going, "Christ, he's playing well here. We're probably going to lose him, mm-hmm. or we can plan. We can plan to lose him." So uh, a player will come in probably a season before they'll play. And from a fan's point of view, I think, oh, why have we spent 20 million on this player? He's not going to come in and play. Like, he's not even playing. He's playing in the 23s. What's the point? And then they'll sell a player from the first team. That player will come in and be a regular player. So they almost evolve them in the football club, get them understanding of the football club, how it's going to play, mm. work with them on the training ground. They come in, they're ready-made. You know, Luke Thomas, the left-back, 
Chilwell's left. Yeah. Club 50 million for him. Lou Thomas has come through the, the academy. It's it's a, it's, it's, br- it's a brilliant system they've got there. It, it really is. James Justin, that one as well, wasn't it? Who, um, yeah. From Luton. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was uh, I, when I was loan manager um, at uh, obviously Leicester, and I go and watch play, uh, players. And I remember being at, at Colchester, work going to watch a player, uh, going to watch Colchester play uh, as a team to see if it would suit one of our players. And uh, James Justin was playing for Luton, and I was sitting next to a Tottenham scout who I know really, really well. He used to be a coach of mine, and he'd come to watch James Justin, and he was like, "Not sure about him. The club are keen on him, but I'm not sure. Not sure about him." Look at him now. I bet Tottenham mm. wish I'd signed him now. <laughs> that is Spurs in a nutshell. That is isn't it? <laughs> decision. Very Spursy thing to do is to yeah. uh, to, to adjust it. Oh my god! But, I can't yeah. get over that. You, you mentioned about Southampton as well. You know, not not getting in the way of players um, going on to do better things. Norwich as well. I kind of get that vibe with Leicester as well. And and, and having that sort of outlook where you're letting these players move on, it allows you to plan, doesn't it? Like you said. If you're almost preparing for these players to go on, then it, it frees up time for you to replace them, and they do that probably just as well as anybody else, if not better than anybody else to Leicester. Yeah, they do. They do it really, really well, and um, they just plan. They're planning ahead, and one thing they do, I think they do really well, is you, you don't see it. So, say the people in recruitment, the coaches at the football club, they get rewarded as well. So, mm. when a Manchester United or Liverpool come knocking and say, "Look, we'll," We want you as our recruitment manager. We want you as our coach. The, the coaches just go, nah, I'm happy here. I'm getting rewarded what I'm doing. I'm getting value in what I'm doing. I'm, I'm yeah. producing people for the first team because there's a pathway. Why, why would I leave? Why would I leave? I, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying my role at the football club. Um, so, yeah, the planning there is, is, is really, really good. It's a brilliant family club as well. When I was there, they've moved training grounds now. I mean, the tra- new training grounds, unbelievable. But the old training ground was really, really small. Um, everyone was tight knit together. It was it was great fun from the you know from the the canteen ladies to the the, to the kit men, the um, the laundry ladies to the the youth team players. It, it was brilliant. It was, and I think that's the the ethics of the football club. And again, it comes from the top. The, the club is led really really well because they've got owners who care about the football club uh, and they're planning for the future all the time. They're just not there to to make money. I mean, they're super rich, the owners, super yeah. rich, but they're doing it out of love. And that just filters down. If someone's leading right from the top, it filters down right through the whole system. Yeah, yeah. The, the one takeaway from this, I'll be on YouTube later looking for Jamie Vardy being blessed by a monk because I need that <laughs> video in my life. <laughs> That's the video that I really want to see now. Speaking of Vardy, because he's such a character, is he really all Red Bull before a game? Is that like kind of how he prepares? Is he just smashing Red Bulls? He drinks a lot of Red Bull, yeah. Does he? Uh, yeah, that's yeah. understanding because it doesn't it tie in with the traditional footballer's diet, does it? No, it, it, it doesn't. Um, but Vard is Vard is unique. He's, yeah. he's a unique character. He's a unique person. Brilliant person, you know. Family man um, loves his family dearly. He's a he's a he's a um, a good person. Obviously, a brilliant footballer. But yeah, yeah he's got his he's got his own ways. Uh, that work for him. That, that work for him, and they work really well for him. And I've never met anyone so confident in my whole life. But not arrogant. Yeah. Confident. Just confident in himself. Understands himself. Happy within his own skin. And he's infectious. He rubs off on you. He really, really does. Um, I mean, you have to be on your toes when you're around him. He's, he, there's never a boring moment. But it's yeah. brilliant. You know, people like that, and like, he's been very, very successful. Yeah, he does. He does enjoy a. He does enjoy a Red Bull, I must admit. Yeah. Football you, um, needs characters like him. Sorry, go on, Mackie. No, I was just going to say with um, with Jamie Vardy, do you think there's sort of the window of him maybe going out to another club as, as being and gone now? Uh, or do you think there's maybe still an opportunity? Because was it Arsenal? He was quite close to a... Yeah, to at one point, before. yeah. But, um, you know, he, he's... He's less than out through and through, really, isn't he? So um, I wonder if if the chance has gone for me. You know, he might not want to leave now, but uh, do, is that drink there's any opportunity he could go? No, I don't think he'll leave, and I think that's um, I think that was down to him. I don't think he ever wanted to leave. I think he's so he's so grateful for the the opportunity he got from Leicester because you've got to remember when he went there in his first season in the championship, it didn't really work out for him. 
it was only the second season in the championship where he'd done really, really well with Jack, with David Nugent up front. Yeah. And that kind of built his career and the club were very loyal to him and um, stood by him, and rightly so, because obviously he's a brilliant player. Um, but yeah, I, I believe he turned, I don't know, like, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I believe he turned down Arsenal, like you say, and I can't ever see him leaving Leicester. Um, I know he loves the football club. He's He's loved there as well. That's a major thing. He's a club legend. He, look, he's won the Premier League. He's yeah. got to a Champions League quarter final. They're still a top four team. They're going to be in the FA Cup final. He's got a chance to win in the FA Cup. He, I mean, he's played for his country. He doesn't want to play for his country anymore. He's done everything in his career. So, no, I don't think he will leave. And um, I just look, he's still a brilliant player. He's still so effective. And how long you can keep playing again is unique. He'll keep playing yeah. for many years because. He looks like he's getting quicker, to be honest, but most of the round, he's brilliant. Yeah, out of curiosity, obviously his story now, I'd like to think will be made into a movie at some point. Who plays Dean Hammond in that movie? <laughs> 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 oh, what a question, I ain't got an answer for that. Um, maybe, like a, maybe like a Mark Wahlberg, a Brad Pitt, do you have oh, anyone in mind, know, do you uh, think? So- Someone with big teeth, probably. <laughs> we get yeah. Luis Suarez in. Have you heard he's now? Yeah. I'll have to have a think about that. I probably won't get into the movie, but yeah. Um, but you can always play yourself, you know, but like it'd be nice then to, if Jamie comes up to you and says, Dino, look, they're doing a movie about me. Who do you want to play you? And you're like, well, we talk about you. Do you know what? I'd do that I'd play myself. That'd be good. That'd be a good afternoon's work, doesn't it? Yeah, it wouldn't be bad, would it? Nice little paid gig for you as well, the Jamie Barney <laughs> movie. Everyone else has actors, like Clark Dale be yeah. Denzel Washington and uh, <laughs> be himself showing up. That would be class. <laughs> that would be, I'd watch that film. Start to finish, I would watch it. Only, only to see Dean, not Bavardi. I know his story. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, see how acting skills are, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that will happen. I've got this weird feeling a Jamie Vardy movie is going to happen at some point. So, obviously, when it comes out, I'll keep an eye out for you, Dino. But um, yeah, we have a, we've got a question for you, mate, from a massive Saints fan, um, my mate Joe. It's in two parts, actually. One is uh, part Leicester, the other is part uh, Southampton. Um, so the initial Leicester part, you wanted to get your opinion. You know, why do you think Leicester have started to lose their form this season? What What is the, the sort of the reason for the drop off, do you think? Hard question, really, because it happened last year as well. Mm. Uh, I don't think they'll drop off. Look, that's a actually that's a bold statement. They've got some really hard fixtures. What they got United, um, Spurs, is it? Yeah, so yeah. they've got they've got a tough run in. Um, I don't know. I, I really, really don't know. I, I, I'm not answering the question. It happened last year for whatever reason. I think coming back from lockdown didn't really help them, mm. um, and they couldn't go back into their flow. Um, but I think they'll do it this year. I think they'll they'll hang in there. Um, and, and and stay in the top four. Um, it's going to be tight because I think Liverpool will win all their last games. Um, but I don't know why it's dropped off. Um, it won't be anything to do with, with through lack of preparation or lack of desire or inexperience because they've been in this position before. You know, the manager's top class. Um, the club is, is set to achieve. Um, uh, has the FA Cup been a distraction? I don't think so. Um, so I think their form has dipped a little bit. There's been yeah. a lot of injuries this season for, yeah, for them. Yeah. I think that's been a, a major thing where it's disrupted the, the team maybe. And, and Brendan's had to change shape when he's, he's not wanted to, when he's had to play a back three, when he actually wants to play a back four or vice versa. Mm. Uh, so I think they'll be okay this year. I think they've got that experience from last year and they'll, they'll hang in there. But um, yeah, I'm not sure why they've, they've lost. Look, why they performed against Newcastle like they did and lost 4-2. Yeah. That, that was a surprise because I think if they'd won that game, you, you'd definitely say they were getting the top four. Mm, yeah. The second part of that question obviously is Southampton-based. Um, Joe was asking, who was the best player you played with at Southampton? Oh, I always get asked this question. I feel so bad answering it because I played with such, such well, some top-class players who massively helped me in my career to be successful. So, Look, Ricky Lambert was unbelievable. Uh, Morgan Snyderlin was brilliant. Jason Punchin. There was lots of players that don't get mentioned because they didn't play a huge role, but played a very vital role. Mm. David Connolly, unbelievable. Um, Danny Butterfield within the group was was brilliant. Then you've got obviously Luke Shaw, um, Oxlade-Chamberlain, 
Jose Fonte again, mm. uh, still playing. He's captain in uh, the French team at the moment, the top of the league, and they all second or whatever. So he's yeah. still going. Yeah, he's really what, 36, 37. So, but I'd have to say Adam Lallana. Adam Lallana was a joke. He was fantastic. I mean, yeah. what a player. Naturally, naturally brilliant, I would say. Blessed with natural ability, but worked as hard as anyone, if not harder, on, on his football. Uh, on his craft, loved training. Um, he was demanding yeah, mm-hmm. from a young age. He'd let you know. I remember him one time having a good old argument with Raddy Jaidi. He's not the sort of person <laughs> you want to really pick on, but <laughs> stood his ground and would like believed in what he was saying. Um, but what a player! I mean, his balance on and off the ball, his vision. He looked like he was playing like in slow motion. You know, when like like he could slow the game down. He knew where everyone was. His awareness was good. Um, and just kept improving as a player. Unfortunately, he's had a few injuries, which is, I think he would have had a, a more consistent Liverpool career um, if he hadn't have had the injuries. But Adam Alana was was brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. good show. Very good show, mate. Uh, Vecchi, I believe we have our 1-11 to 11 now. Is that correct? We do. And I, I think this is probably going to be quite a good 1-11. Oh, to 11. Um, this, be, this might be the tastiest 1-11 to 11 we've had yet. Yeah. Before I, I, I get into 1 to 11, Dean, you know, we, we do tend to ask most players uh, this as well, and especially when you've played in, in midfield. Is there a standout sort of best player you've played against? I'm assuming probably, you probably say in the Premier League. Um, and when you've just thought, wow, that was just a complete different level. Well, except for training against um, um, Kante every day, which is really <laughs> incredible. Um, yeah. But Look, lots of players stand out and I played against some top players I was lucky to play against and uh, very grateful I did. But I'd say one player that gave me the hardest afternoon or the hardest match in his prime, Ozil, who played Arsenal at home. Interesting. <laughs> Jesus Christ, honestly. He was, I don't know if he was just that game he was on it, but he was unbelievable. He was just, like again, I mentioned about Adam Milana, he just mm. looked like he slowed the game down. Like he was playing the Matrix. He just slowed everything down. He took you into areas where you didn't want to go. He, The way he received the ball, you couldn't get it off him. His movement was brilliant. His timing of his movement, yeah, unbelievable. I came off that pit. We drew one on one all, luckily. I'm not sure how we did, but I, I, I was, excuse my French, I was fucked, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he, he, yeah, Ozil was, was, was class and not the type of player I'd like to play against every week. Yeah. Did you yeah. understand the criticism of him? Sorry, Becky, just to, because obviously Ozil come under heavy scrutiny and you know it, it did not end well at Arsenal. Did you understand the, the criticism? Yes, because I think if he looks back on his career and the player he is or the player he was, um, he should have done, well, not should, done, like, he could have done more. Mm. And I think if he'd be, if he'd, but you never know what's going on or why people have football, what the reason is or why they're not performing well. Again, mental health you're talking about, there could be all sorts of demons going on mm-hmm. in his head and his confidence could be really low. There could be stuff off the pitch we don't know about. But he just, he was, on his day, he's unbelievable. And I think he just could have got more out of himself if he's just mm-hmm. running around a little bit. And yeah. it's it, it, yeah. that simple thing because when he was on the ball, he was brilliant. The assists he would get, the goals he would get, um, the, the skills he would come out with. But sometimes you just think, just run. Just run a little bit more, you know, move into that space. He, look, the day I played against him, he definitely did that. So <laughs> if he could have done that every week, he made me look silly on many occasions. Yeah. Yeah. I think he just could have got a little bit more out of himself, yeah. yeah. Those um, few years at Madrid and the first couple of years at Arsenal, he was unplayable, wasn't he? I think that period, I think Arsenal fans thought, what, what if we signed you? He's going to absolutely turn us, you know, turn us around. But uh, for whatever reason, like you say, it didn't quite uh, materialise on from that. Um, so you're, you're 1 to 11 then, uh, Dean. Um, you can pick whatever formation you like. You can put whatever yeah. manager they like. You can be in the team if you like. Um, that's, that's totally up to you. But i got a feeling this is going to be, a, like you say, Spoon, quite a, quite a decent one. This. Oh, this will be tasty. Oh, I've got to pick a manager as well, did you say? Um yeah, I mean, well, you, you don't have to. Um, no, no, you manage I'll, less. I'll, I'll manage the team. How about that? I don't think I'll All right, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll down. <laughs> uh, it'd be easy to manage him as well. Um, <laughs> look, I, again, 
look, and there's lots of players I play with, and I'm going to miss a load out, but I go Casper Smeichel in goal. Yeah, um, yeah. Brilliant goalkeeper. Um, good guy as well. Um, a winner, pure winner. Whether he's in training, in games, he was top class. He really, really was. Um, left back, I'd have to go Wayne Bridge. So I played with Wayne Bridge at, at Brighton on loan. He was brilliant. Honestly, one of the fittest guys you'll ever meet in your life. But always looked knackered. But he was, <laughs> he'd be up and down that wing for 90 minutes at the same pace, man of the match every week. But he'd look knackered after two minutes. And you're thinking, Bridget, are you all right, mate? But then you just go and take four players on and just whip across him. But I just, I suppose that's just the way he played. But he was brilliant. Nice guy as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I remember, yeah, he's just a top bloke. And then Jose Fonte, I'd say, centre off. Um, mm. was class really really good a winner you know he saw the ambition of the club he dropped down from the championship to sign for Southampton in League One um, and then went all the way through um, to take him into Europe so uh, what a player uh, I, I always find this difficult this one because I played the other centre half obviously Robert Hoof Wes Morgan Matty Upson I played with who was class mm. oh. uh, Gordon Greer was good as well. Um, oh, it's, it's a tough one, a really tough one. But I'd have to, just because I, I have to put him in. I always want to put Matty Upson in, but I'd, I'd have to, I have to go Wes Morgan. I mean, he's won yeah. the Premier League. He was a captain at Leicester. I have to put Wes in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brilliant player. Really, really was. Um, and right back's always an interesting one. Who would I put a right back? It's going to sound bad. I played with some really, really, really good right backs, but they're all very similar. If that if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to go. Uh, I tell you what, I'd have to go Bruno at Brighton. Oh, okay. uh, brilliant, brilliant player. Coming to came into England towards the end of his career, actually, um, under Gus Boyet. But um, yeah, good player, attacking player. So this is an attacking team. Very, a very attacking team. Mm. Uh, Riyad Mahrez, I'll go 4 4 2. Riyad Mahrez on the right wing. Yeah, good yeah. Show. Got to put Riyad Mahrez there. Got to put Adam Lalana in the left wing. That's yeah. them two are pretty simple. Again, missing players out, but we'll go with them two. Then the midfield, well, well, Kante's a must, isn't he? Um, yeah. You've had some uh, serious midfield competition, haven't you? Uh, I've got, I've got no Kante. Someone don't like me up above, mate. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. Um, yeah. But uh, so can say centre mid, I'd have to say, and then alongside him. But again, I'm missing some players out. Danny Drinkwater was brilliant. Uh, Morgan Snyderlin was brilliant. Jack Cork was good. Mm. Um, even Davis at, uh, at Southampton was yeah. good. James Ward Prowse. But I've got to put Esteban Cambiasso in. I have to put him in. I mean, what, what a player. That mm. season that I had with him at Leicester, I learned so much off him. So much. And uh, he, he played the best. No look switch of play you've ever seen in your life. You couldn't even know he was going to hit it. So the ball would come back to him with his left foot, and he'd from this from this angle on the left foot, he'd smash the ball out there, about a fifty yard ball, and you'd look at him, gone, "Why the fuck has he played that?" <laughs> no one had it. And then suddenly the full back of the wing would just run onto the ball, cross it, score, and you'd think, "Okay, all right, Esteban, I won't, I won't yeah. crush." Him. But um, yeah, what a player. And then up front, Jamie Vard is a must. Yeah. Um, oh, I've got to go. I've got to go. Um, I've got to go Ricky Lambert, but it's just because of what he did at, at Southampton. I mean, he got promoted. He got us promoted two years in a row on his own. Really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, Billy Sharp was good. Love playing with Billy. At natural goal scorer. David Nugent, fantastic. Chris Wood was good. Um, Ashley Barnes at Brighton was very, very good. David Conley, I mentioned, was was good. Gulli de Prado was good. I've been lucky. I played with some good strikers. I mean, I played with Kevin Phillips when he came to Leicester. Mm. Um, Paul Kitson, do you remember Paul Kitson at Brighton? Yeah, Paul's Bobby actually. Zamora. I think Paul's coming on at some point as well. Yeah. yeah. Bobby Zamora was unbelievable. Oh, was class. Um, <laughs> I, I played with I played with some players, by the way. It'd be a strong yeah. bench. Um, but yeah, that that. That eleven, I think, would do pretty well. 
oh, that's the strongest 11 we've had. I think the other strongest one, or the strongest one prior to this was Ivan Klasnich, when Ivan Klasnich was on. And his oh, we did have, um, we did have Warren Barton as well, didn't we? Oh, Warren Barton's was good, actually, as well. Yeah, well Warren was, Barton's was pretty tipped. But his was, was an old school. school one. Like, his was, like, a, a very old school one. Like, yeah, the entertainers. Klasnich had, like, you know, he just big down, you know, Modric, Rakitic, started naming all them in midfield. So, uh, the, the, your team and his team, if they faced off, oh, let me tell you, worth a ticket straight away. <laughs> probably. That I'd like to mention that team, I must admit. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a crack inside, mate. That's definitely the strongest one we've had, Becky, so far. Yeah. Even Klasnich, even Klasnich might disagree because he's a confident lad. Like he stuck oh. himself up front as well. <laughs> like there's a lad that doesn't lack confidence, right? He would he might have me take you on, but I'm going to give it to you, Dean. That's the strongest team thus far, mate. Yeah, it's a strong team, mate. Very strong. It is indeed. Yeah. Well, Becky, I think we're all done, mate. Is there anything else you wanted to touch upon before we go? I think we got all the questions out there. Go on got to it, the lab. Um, we got it. Well. We got it all terrific. Well, Dean, thank you again, mate, for coming on. Um, no. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure, mate. Honestly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I can't wait for the Jamie Vardy story to come out on uh, Blu-ray <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and see you on the big screen. But, um, yeah, we'll leave Dean's uh, social media ads uh, below. Obviously, make sure you follow him up. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, all that good jazz. We'll be back next week. I believe our Euros videos will be out, Becky. Is that right next week? Yeah. Give or take. So we'll have all that content coming soon, amongst other things. So, uh, yeah, make sure you like and subscribe. And we'll see you next week, people. Take care. Ciao for now.